looks ten. MTV presents Rod Stewart is being sponsored by Canada Dry Ginger Ale. for Canada Dry Ginger Ale. Next setup, which is the close-ups of Rod um, peeking through the blinds with the binoculars. And the camera's outside on the scaffolding looking back in. And this is the tie-in shot. This is actually the beginning of the scene where he comes walking along the balcony and uh, looks out over the balcony towards Moose and Kay down by the pool. So this is the start of the scene. And listen, guys. Shh. Guys, please. It's very difficult to hear. Jonathan? Mark is happy as we speak. Do you think your viewers would be interested in this? Hmm. What do you need, Ron? No, I was just no. passing a mere comment. I think he's just a, a voyeur. Well, That's about I best way. Uh, Somebody likes to look at women in other apartments undressing. I spent most of my teenage life doing that. Oh, no, did I say that? Cut! <laughs> it's fun. It's really dope. It's the first time I've ever done a video without actually singing in it. I mean, there's no dialogue. I mean, if I can pick up some dialogue, then I'll know whether I can act on it. Do you think the viewers are going to be interested in this? As I said, it's all new to me, so I need the director to tell me exactly what to do and where to move to. You know, so I tend to be a little bit cumbersome. Well, I'm, I'm very aware of the camera. You know, I know I've got an instinctive feel for the camera. I, I believe, anyway. I'm just going to have a look now at the projection. Right. So I'll tighten you go now. One more in, you know? Yeah, especially if you're going to do two a face one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. Okay. It'll take a few minutes, uh, Terry. Take five. What I would minutes. like to know is whether the viewers of MTV will be interested in this procedure. What say you, gentlemen? I think so. Tonight on the sound stage will be um, basically me doing the track with Jeff Beck. Jeff played the solo on the on the track, as you know, and he's going to play the solo on the video. And it'll be the first time we've worked together since uh, 1968 when we had the Jeff Beck group together. So looking forward to seeing him this evening. He owes me five pounds too.
Theatre or something. I was off to a flying start there. I was off to a flying start and they stopped me. You know, I don't understand. Who is the address in the Got a mirror. So I'm just going to adjust. Shh. Rob, you got five minutes. I'm talking to MTV, please. I'm just going to adjust my hair now, then continue with the performance, okay? Shh. group. Mickey Waller on drums there, Ron Wood on guitar, Mickey Hopkins struggling to play the piano and your good self here at the vocals. Martha, you see me there? We're doing shapes of things to come. Wasn't that a Yardbirds tune? Yeah, an old yard, a Yardbirds song. I've got the yellow trousers on there with the unfortunate red plastic jacket. There's a little bit of early throwing the microphone right. stand around. There's Ron Wood, he's a lad, look. <laughs> he's changed a lot, hasn't he? Really? How, how old are you guys then? Uh, 20, you know, early 20s, I think. We heard that the first time you guys played at the Fillmore with Jeff Beck, you sang the first song from backstage. What, when I hid behind ramps? Well, it was our first, um, with the Jeff Beck group, it was our first American appearance. And we were first on the bill, Grateful Dead were top in the bill. And we were really scared, we were really scared. And I suffered from stage fright. So my voice just caved out, so I ran behind the amps and sang from there, you know. And when I heard the applause of the audience, that I was okay, then I ran back out front and started singing. It was good. Joining the Jeff Beck group was really your first big break. How did you meet Jeff? It's about, I would say it was about 1967, 66. Um, Jeff had left the Yardbirds. He, well, actually, I think he got fired for non-appearance a few times with the Yardbirds. That's something people don't know. I'd been fired from the group I was in, and the group Woody was in, the Birds, they'd fallen apart, the seams. And so, basically, we were all unemployed. Oh, he was lurking in this club one night, and uh, I think we were the last two people in there. That's it. I came up and said, are you a taxi driver? And you said, may I play the guitar? And you said to me, are you a bouncer? No, I said, no, I'm a singer. His elbow was sliding forward like that. I thought, well, I'll catch him just before it slips off the end of the table. And uh, no, it was great. I'd, we met up in a club. We'd known it's, it's we'd like known William, it. Yeah, there's a London club where all sorts of things go on at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, like Ron Wood was there, for instance. Yeah. No, I had to find a vocalist from somewhere. I thought, well, I might as well get the best first, you know what I mean? Not a bad choice, old boy. Yeah. Well, it was financially a little embarrassing at times. Um, there's one story I remember, me and Woody were staying at the Gorham Hotel in New York and uh, we hadn't been paid, we were getting paid 35 pounds a week, which is about 70, 80 dollars a week, and we hadn't been paid for three weeks. And we used to have to go and steal eggs at the local delicatessen for our breakfast. That was a bit, uh, bit, a bit distressing for us both. I remember I vowed never, after being in America for six months, I said, I'm never coming back. And Woody and I agreed, we said, we're never coming back to America. We miss Britain so much, we're never coming back, and we both live here now. So. Why? What didn't you like about it? I think we were both homesick, you know. We'd never been away from our mums and dads for more than two weeks, probably. That was silly, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> How much did the first hour cost the album that we did together? Oh, two? Um, you bet me. Thirty-three right. pounds, four and sixpence. <laughs> no, exactly. It was. It was about. It was under. It was under thirty thousand quid. So it was I, a joke, you know. Which is about seventy thousand dollars. <laughs> we didn't even pay the bill. We just ran out without paying. Yeah. We did. We did it in a week. You know, if everybody, anybody remembers that album, uh, true. We, we did it in a week, didn't we? Yeah. I mean, studio time was was expensive for us even then. You know, we didn't. I I, I couldn't afford to pay him. And, he sold and ran away and all that stuff. So did Ron Wood. I never got paid either. <laughs> yeah, no. That was Abbey Road. We did it at Abbey Road. I enjoyed Road, that. And that's probably the most enjoyable time of my life, actually, making that first album. Yeah, it was good. It was good. It's like, we've mm -hmm. already been on the road for 18 months with that material. Just went mm -hmm. straight in the studio. That's it. It was easy. That's the way to make a record. You don't hang around for six months making a record. Do you? If you've well, got you, the idea, you, you guys... You've six albums in 15 years. <laughs> you should know. <laughs> You're a real strong vocalist, and Jeff is someone who has always led the group with guitar. It was the Jeff Beck group. Was there a point where you felt competitive with Jeff's guitar? 
Good question. No, I never, I never did. I think we, we always complimented each other. Um, that's the way I looked at it. I think at certain times, to be honest, Jeff became a little envious of the relationship between me and Woody, because Woody and I would be on the left-hand side of the stage, and Jeff would always be over on the right-hand stage. And me and Woody were always messing about with each other, and we had a sort of, and still have, hopefully, a sort of fashion con consciousness, you know? And he got a little envious at one point. I was so envious that he fired Woody. <laughs> and I, I remember telling Jeff, I said, I don't think there's, I think I'll try and stay with the band, but I miss Woody, you know? Because I think half the success of the band is because we're all mates. And I still think that holds, you know, it's very important to have your mates in the band. And just once Woody had left, it was like losing a leg for me. So we left and uh, joined the Faces pop group. everybody was taking music extremely seriously. There was no room for a laugh and a joke in music. And I think it was like a breath of fresh air. I remember we played a festival with uh, uh, Mark Boland, T-Rex, and a lot of bands, glam rock bands, for want of a better word, and we just blew them all off the stage because we all came on, you know, blind drunk, and fell about the stage, and uh, that was our style, which was initiated by Ronnie Lane, bless him. was always like the image of the faces. He was the one who, uh, not me and Woody, he was the one who was like the sort of heavy drinker and always had a smile on his face, always had a, a joke, and really was the main songwriter, you know. He was the spirit behind the faces. It was never me or Woody. It was like me and Woody were the front men and probably the two, you know, glamorous ones or whatever. But uh, Laney was the spirit. So when Ron left, did that really take the heart out of that? Yeah, it did. It did. And, and uh, I know why Ronnie left. He left because I was making solo albums and they were becoming successful. And he thought that was going to tear the band apart at one point. And of course it did. <laughs> Actually, Woody looks pretty good there, I must admit. That's Tetsu Yamahushi I was telling you about, the bass player. So That's me striking a very unfortunate <laughs> pose in the bell-bottom yellow trousers. <laughs> I have nothing to do on this high
interesting that you do um, you do one of your solo tunes with the band. Yeah, I was allowed. I was allowed three or four at night, I think. It didn't create resentment in the band towards you that your solo records were doing well and, and largely pulling along the sales of of the Faces albums. Oh, there was a, there was resentment there. That was without doubt, you know. But I think everybody covered it up real well. Apart from Ronnie, he would actually come out and tell me, he said, Look, I think I'm really pissed off, you know, that we started out as a band and I now feel that we're becoming your backing group, you know. Did that make you self-conscious? Oh, yeah, I was very self-conscious about it. Didn't stop me making from making up solo albums, though. So we're going wrong. Being in a band and building a solo career isn't so unusual these days, but it was an impossible balancing act then. Neither of his two record companies was willing to settle for half an artist, nor were the faces. Rod had little to smile about during the recording of Smiler in 1974. This particular track still lacks a lot of top, and if you don't get any top on it, then there's no go with it at all. All right, it goes somewhere else, won't I? Let's brighten it up broadband. Do something because it sounds useless. Want to hear it again? Yeah. If you ever change your mind about leaving, leaving me behind, baby, bring it to me. Bring your sweet love and bring it on home to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know the days of cheap record players have gone as for every high and low counts and we haven't got it right so far I might have to go back to New York or I'd go to London or stay here another year and a half before it's right <laughs> so this far I was supposed to be here for a week but it looks like I'm going to be here for another week after Wednesday you more than a lot of other people must have more experience of, of breaking and rebuilding and breaking and rebuilding. isn't every every new disc is almost a a fresh onslaught onto a new market, isn't it? Well, it's, uh, it's not quite. It's because I've made, I've made a new album for two years. You see, there hasn't been a new release for me for two years. And so you're not too sure whether you're going to be accepted again. It's just me. I'm a very insecure person. You know, that's the way I feel. I'm a Capricorn, and I need people to tell me how good I am. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I always wanted to be famous. But I didn't necessarily want to be rich. You know, when I, when I left school, I thought, I must be famous. And this probably come out of something that I wanted to show the other guys that I was good enough. Rod did show the faces he was good enough, and just in time, because it turned out bandmate Ron Wood had plans for a new career of his own with the Rolling Stones. <laughs> a discussion one night and uh, he'd already done the Stones tour. Mm. Oh, just before that, I remember having a conversation with Jagger and he said, I would never steal Woody from you, Rod. You know, I'd never steal Woody from us. I really respect you for that, Mick. Of course he did. seen him for uh, I haven't seen him for about 18 months I got a great telegram from him about six months ago it said Rod I have to inform you and would you tell the rest of the faces that I'm joining the Rolling Stones <laughs> <laughs> only six months ago why did you try and do that keep the faces and your career going I mean I wrote to him long player and every picture tells a story really we're on the charts simultaneously yeah, yeah. well I was already into I'd already signed a contract to do, a, uh, you know, like solo albums before I joined The Faces. There were things that I wanted to put on my albums that I didn't think The Faces could play. It wasn't, it wasn't a very acoustical band, which is a lot of things in the early days is all I had was acoustic guitars and drums. This is my youngest affiliation. Come on over here by the window. He's not too shy. And his name's Sean. I think he's inherited my basic shyness of not being able to tell people what he really feels. He doesn't, I, he thinks a lot, he's got, he thinks a lot. I know he's thinking about what he's just seen when he's seen a, a concert, but he doesn't actually tell me what he feels. Well, I'll give him a chance, he's only three, Don, you know what I mean, old chap? So what do you think that you've taken from your parents? From my parents' character, 
my, both my prayers. I've, I've got my mum's uh, wanting to have a good time, you know, demanding life give you a good time, which is not always a good thing. Um, and I've inherited my dad's <clears throat> shyness, I think, especially, oh, you won't believe, especially about women. I'm very shy around women. Like, she don't believe that one iota. It's true. Rod, the other night you told me that your girlfriend's in New York, you live in Los Angeles, but your heart's in England. Why is that? Well, that's where I was born, you know. That's London is where I was born, and uh, it may be time for me to go back pretty soon. I miss it that much. And I don't know what I miss about it. I just not just pubs and football and me, me parents. It's just that's where my heart is, you know, there in Scotland. Does the rest of your family still relate to you in the same way? Yeah, I believe so. I've got uh, my eldest brother still tells me when I'm treading off the straight and narrow, as far as he's concerned, anyway. I mean, it's very difficult for them to be untouched by my success. Of course, they're touched by it. But uh, they, they handle it real well. My eldest brother is probably a bigger rock star than I am in his own mind. My father wanted me to play soccer when I left school, and in actual fact, I did for about uh, six weeks. Uh, I think he was very disappointed when I didn't become a professional because we're a soccer family, everybody, all the boys play. Um, he was a bit disappointed, but uh, they didn't hold me back one bit. I mean, in fact, it was my dad that bought me a guitar and got me into the music business. I mean, I was, I was this is terrible. I was making a model railway, you see, when I was about 15, a model railway. I asked my dad for Christmas, I said, I'd like a station for my model railway. Instead, he brought me home a guitar for no apparent reason. So that was the turning point. After all. That's me when the nose growing and I'm not holding a monkey. Mm. Is this the whole family? Hey, that's my family, dear. That's me with a common pig. I love that picture. I look, I look like such a hooligan. Rod, you've once said that this was one of the best songs you thought you'd ever written. Do you still think that? Yeah, I, b I believe so. I think there's, a, there's one other song, two other songs on this album that are fairly close to it. But this one was a very personal statement. It sort of summed up a lot of my life, which is very difficult to do in a song. I'd like to just get this off my chest, viewers. I mean, you've been watching this load of babble for the last 20 minutes. Is it really, really interesting viewing? Or have you turned to another channel? Five years ago, I must admit, when I was very gullible to that sort of thing, but nowadays I think I've matured somewhat. Do you recognise maturity in yourself? Yeah, I think so. It's, uh, willpower is maturity, yeah. I think. What, yeah. willpower to withstand the pressures? Yeah, yeah, and stop yourself doing from something, such as dragging someone off between the sheets, yeah. as you said. But, but a lot of people in your position claim that that is a way of recharging or refueling their batteries. Oh, I disagree. I disagree. You come to a period where you think 
you know, it's just a waste of time. Complete and utter waste of time. You can't prove anything to yourself. It's not really a, you know, a claim to masculinity, is it? No. Rod's taste in women ran from beautiful to famous and continued to get a lot of attention in the press. In fact, we asked the same sort of questions ten years later. Your wife, Alana, has been quoted as being very angry about your, and I quote, swinging lifestyle. What is that swinging lifestyle? I don't, did she say that? It's very unlike her to use such old-fashioned 60s expressions like swinging lifestyle, but uh, I really don't, I enjoy a certain amount of freedom. Uh, and I would, if I ever got married again, would demand that in, in marriage. And that doesn't mean to say, you know, I want to go and screw everybody that exists. I want to be able to do exactly what I want to do. That's what I mean. You know, if I want to go down the pub with the boys and stay there for three hours, then I should be able to do it. That's your swinging lifestyle? That's about it, mate. It's, what you're talking about is really exaggerated. Whatever she's talking about. A woman is very important. I won't say women. I'll say a woman is very important in my life. I find it very difficult to, to exist without a woman in my life. I think everybody does. I mean, it's very important to have that girl next to you that's not only your lover but your friend and someone that supports you in everything. Boy, that could have been a line of a song right there. Yeah, well, <laughs> we'll try next time. My name there wasn't, but uh, that's a song about somebody. Do you still keep in contact with no, this no, person? No, no, I'm sure she's been buried by now. <laughs> Boy, it's been a long time that you've been performing, Maggie. May I ever get tired of it? No, no. I still can't remember the words either. It's always about the last song we play, and by then I'm sort of over the top, as it were. <laughs> it's, it's good fun being up there, mate. You want to try it one day. It's great fun. Alone in your bed at night. It's a half past midnight. As you turn at your sideline. Oh, something ain't right. Sorry, dear. <laughs> you, <laughs> um, let's talk about the new album, Camouflage. How do you like it? It's good. I think it's very good. My best effort to, to date. Is that a fact? You really yeah, think that? I think it's very good. It's the first time I brought in a, an outside producer. Would you mind being quiet? I'm trying to do an interview here. I'm sorry about that, viewers. It won't happen again. On the album, you covered Freeze All Right Now, which is a rock and roll classic. Why did you decide to update that song today? Um, it's, a, it's a good song to sing. Obviously, it was written by Paul Rogers, and I think the two of us have got really same, the same style of singing. And it really was a gamble. I mean, it, we could have done Honky Tonk Woman or something else and see how it turns out, just to, for an experiment. And it was a gamble, and I think probably I might get a lot of criticism for doing it. And it wasn't necessary an update. It was more just to show that the song could be sang in a different way. Mm -hmm. You went through a, pe a period of time when um, the, the press was very, very kind to you, with especially your first, your early solo albums, and then maybe in the mid-70s. That kind of turned on you. Did that bother you? 
It did at the time, in, in, in retrospect, looking back on it, it's, it's sort of what they do to everybody, really. I mean, they, you know, once you get too successful, it's time to knock them all down, knock you down. So it was upsetting, but uh, we've come through it. Do you I'm think... still not the most popular pebble on the beach, as far as rock critics are concerned, but I'm just going to have to live with that. All I know is when I make an album, I do the best I can. You can only... That's, that's it. Do the best you can. I like the way it was shot. It had a lovely sort of dusty sheen to it. And of course, that was one of the first videos, I believe, that there was any break dancing in, too. When you release an album, do you then wait for the reviews to come back and watch them and see what they say? I, th I think it's important to, to read reviews. You know, I think it's important because they say that your enemies sometimes will tell you the truth as opposed to your friends. I sometimes think that if your critics are your enemies, you should listen to them just a wee bit mm -hmm. and find some common denominator and try and improve what you're doing. You were talking about how yours and Paul Rogers' voice are very similar. How would you characterize your voice? Oh, God, I think everybody's already done that for me. Um, it's, it's, it's a moving voice, you know. Sometimes I hear the songs I've sung and I get moved by them. I mean, trouble moves me. Uh, it's a passionate voice. It's sometimes dreadfully out of tune, but don't worry about little things like that. Is there somebody that you think that you sound like? Well, in the old days, I used to try and sound like Otis Redding and Sam Cooke. I think I just sound like me now. Yeah, she's as if you haven't grown up? I don't really want to grow up, you know. I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an element in every man that should exist, you know, and always keep that little element of the boyishness. You know, I think it's very important. I think we should be adults and handle the world like adults, but let's keep that childlike quality in all of us. Let's be able to cry, let's be able to laugh and do whatever we want to do. You're turning 40 next year. How do you feel about that? Yeah, it's... I can't say. It doesn't worry me. It's, uh, it didn't worry me when I was 30. I mean, I think I'm wearing it pretty well. And uh, as far as being an entertainer, a rock singer, it doesn't embarrass me, you know, right now. I think I'll know when it does. I think I look better now than I ever did, quite honestly. Don't you think, Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, everyone's going over there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>